his word to our hearts this morning. Shall we turn to Psalm 24? I'd like to suggest to you how this psalm was first uh, uh, put into effect in the story of the people of Israel. It was written to commemorate the return of the sacred Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. David wrote four psalms to commemorate that occasion. Psalm 132, Psalm 68, Psalm 24, and Psalm 87. He had made one disastrous attempt to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, and this time he was going to do God's work in God's way. You can see the procession as it's moving towards the city of Jerusalem, coming through the high hills of Judah. Finally, there it stands, crowning Mount Zion, the magnificent city of Jerusalem. The choir begins to sing, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And then King David, dancing before the Lord with all his might, bursts into song. He says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? The choir picks up the psalm and gives the answer. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Whatever you have that word, Selah, in the Psalms, it simply means there. What do you think of that? Selah. Presently the king and the priests and the choir and the rejoicing people arrive at the top of the hills and they stand in front of the massive gates of Jerusalem. David sings, lift up your head, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. There's a sentinel standing there. He says, who is this king of glory? David says, the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The gates remain closed. So the whole choir picks up the chorus. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Again the sentinel asks the question, who is this king of glory? And now the king and the choir and all the people thunder out, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory of glory. Selah. What do you think of that? <laughs> when they arranged the when they arranged the liturgy for the temple, they sang a psalm every day. Every Monday they sang the same psalm, every Tuesday the same psalm. Monday they sang Psalm forty eight. Tuesday they sang Psalm eighty two. Wednesday they sang Psalm 94. Thursday, they sang Psalm 81. Friday, it was ni Psalm 93. On the Sabbath day, they sang Psalm 92. But on the first day of the week, they sang Psalm 24. The very day that Jesus rose from the dead and tore its bars away, yeah. they were singing this psalm in the temple. It divides into three parts. In verses 1 and 2, we have the Lord's claim. In verses 3 to 6, we have the Lord's call. In verses 7 to 10, we have the Lord's coming. Here is the Lord's claim. He says, the earth, planet earth, the earth is the Lord's. That's the Lord's claim. 
Now, of course, you understand that our Lord's ultimate territorial claims in space embrace very much more than that. He sits upon the throne of the universe. He looks out across the vast reaches of time and space. He sees countless stars and their satellites traveling at inconceivable velocities hurrying on prodigious orbits, blazing light trails across the velvet blackness of the night, and the roaring thunder of their praise echoes and re-echoes around his throne. He sits upon his throne. He gazes across the vastness of his creation. There spread out before him are one hundred million galaxies. His eye runs across those galaxies. He picks out just one. We call it the Milky Way. Happens to be our galaxy. He ignores the other galaxies of space. He picks out the Milky Way. He runs his eye across the length and breadth of our galaxy. A hundred billion stars spinning around a center in the form of a giant disk a hundred thousand light years from rim to rim six hundred million billion miles of stars he runs his eye across this particular galaxy he watches it spinning and reeling and dancing on its way through space and there, about 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, amidst a hundred billion stars, he picks out one. Just one. We call it the sun. That's our star. He picks out that one. He looks at it. He watches it hurrying around the hub of its universe. It is carrying with it a little family of planets. He watches the sun and its planets hurrying to make their orbits around the center of the galaxy about once every 200 million years. He watches that sun and its little planets. And then he picks out one planet. And he says, that one, that one is mine. The earth is the Lord. He announces it across the vastness of the universe. That little tiny planet, planet Earth, that's mine, he says. C.S. Lewis in one of his books calls it the silent planet. He pictures all the stars and all the suns of space and all the galaxies and all the worlds and all the planets making merry music to their maker as they swing around the great white throne. All except one. There is one planet, he says, which has no song. It is diseased. It's quarantined. He calls it the silent planet. It has no song. I don't think, however, that I should call it the silent planet. I think I'd call it the sobbing planet. It's filled with din and noise and screams and cries of agony and pain. And as the Lord's all-seeing eye passes over the galaxies, and the super galaxies. He lays claim to this one little tiny orb in space, the sobbing planet. And he says, it's mine. That's what is mine. The earth is the Lord's. We wonder, why should he ever bother? After all this world, on which we live is such a puny place, just a tiny microscopic speck of cosmic dust against the vastness of the universe. 
so small, so very, very small indeed, that nothing but the eye of God could have seen it anyway. Why should he ever bother about this place? Well, you see, this world is important to God, not because of its size, which is quite immaterial. It's important to God because of what happened here. Let me give you an illustration. I'll introduce you to a page of English history. Now, I'm quite sure that you would much rather I talked about American history history. Where I went to school, they never taught us any American history. Didn't know you had any. <laughs> Didn't like what we knew anyway. <laughs> so I'll introduce you to a page from British history. I don't suppose you know before that Sunday morning on June the 18th in the year 1815 that anyone had ever heard of a place called Waterloo. Waterloo was just a tiny little village in the empire of Napoleon. So small, so insignificant a place wasn't even worth putting it on the map. But it was there at Waterloo on that Sunday morning that the armies of the Iron Duke of Wellington met and mastered the armies of Napoleon and changed the course of history for all the rest of time. And so you see, Waterloo assumes an importance in the thinking of the historian quite out of proportion to its size. In fact, its size has nothing to do with it. It's important because of what happened there. And that's why this world is important to God. It's important to God because of what happened here. Yes, sir. What we must remember is that sin is of cosmic significance. Sin did not begin on earth. It began in heaven. And it did not begin in the heart of Eve and Adam. It began in the heart of the anointed cherub. And what we must remember is that long before its sponsor brought sin down to earth, sin had assumed a cosmic significance. The Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity. Yes. But you see, before ever sin raised its head in the universe, away back in a distant, dateless, timeless past, before ever the rustle of an angel's wing disturbed the silence of eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit decided sovereignly that they would act in creation. And they knew, with their omniscient wisdom, they knew if ever they acted in creation, that the mystery of iniquity would raise its head in the universe. And before ever they created one of those shining ones, before ever they created an angel or an archangel, cherubim or seraphim, they decided that when the mystery of iniquity raised its head in the universe, that they would deal with it at a place called planet Earth. Now, Satan didn't know that. If he'd known that, he'd have stayed away from this place. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but he came down here. This world has been invaded from outer space. Satan came down here. He dragged down our first parents into sin and turned around and smirked in the face of God. What he didn't know was 
that he had fallen into an ambush that had been prepared for him before the foundation of the world. And so this world spins through space, carrying its human load of guilt and sin, throbbing on its agonizing way, one colossal graveyard, but it's not been abandoned, it's been chosen. And so the Lord sits upon his throne, and he announces to the universe, the earth is the Lord's. That's the Lord's claim. Now listen to the Lord's call, verses 3 to 6. It is true that the earth is the Lord's, that he owns every nook and cranny. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. He owns it all. It all belongs to him, the entire globe, from sea to sea and shore to shore. But you see, there is one place on this planet to which he lays special claim. And that's the land of Israel. That's called his land. His land! The Palestinian Arabs say it belongs to them. Doesn't belong to them and never did. Belongs to him. And he deeded it to Abraham, and then he redeeded it to Isaac, and then he redeeded it to Jacob. Not to the Arabs, but to Jacob and to the children of Israel. But he says, it's mine. Yes. It's my land. You read Ezekiel 38, where you have that story of the coming invasion of the Russian hordes into the nation of Israel. Everybody is euphoric about Russia these days, think think that everything's lovely, peace, peace, when there is no peace. But Russia hasn't gone away, let me tell you, and Ezekiel hasn't changed his mind. But you read that chapter, all the way down that chapter, God says to that great godless nation, he says, that's my land, that's my land. I'll put hooks in your jaws and I'll bring you down to my land. And then we'll find out who sits on the throne. So you see, there's one place on this planet to which he lays special claim, the land of Israel. When you come into the land of Israel, you discover again that there's one place to which he lays special claim, and that's the city of Jerusalem. It's called the city of the great king. Now, of course, the United Nations says it's an international city. It's nothing of the kind. It's his city. That's his city, the city of the great king. And when you come into the city of Jerusalem, you find from this psalm that there are two places to which he lays special claim. One is called the hill, the other is called the holy place. Yes, sir. Now, though, though, those are two different places. The hill is Mount Zion. Yes, sir. The holy place is Mount Moriah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The hill, why that was crowned in David's day by the Jebusite fortress. Joab, his general, had just taken it away from the from the Jebusites and David had made it his capital it stands for all the dynamics of secular power he who held Zion held the city he who held the city held the nation he who holds the nation holds the world that's the hill all the dynamics of secular power Mount Zion the holy place is Mount Moriah the temple wasn't yet built there, it was soon to be built on Mount Moriah. It was already, however, a place of sacred memories was there. It was there a thousand years ago that Abraham had offered up Isaac. 
And there the temple was to stand in the holy place. And so you see the hill stood for all the dynamics of secular power, Mount Zion. The holy place, Mount Moriah, stood for all the dynamics of spiritual power. Yes, 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 yes. Now says the Lord, who wants to have a share? Who would like to have a share in everything that's going to happen on the hill and everything that's going to happen in the holy place? Who would like to have a share in all the dynamics of secular power and all the dynamics of spiritual power? In the crowning day that's coming, by and by. I tell you, that's quite an offer. I'd much rather go in for that than to be president of the United States, let me tell you. You remember on one occasion, Mrs. Zebedee came to the Lord, brought her two boys, James and John. And the Lord saw her coming, he knew exactly what she was going to say. He gave her the opportunity anyway, he said, what is it, Mrs. Zebedee? He, she said, I'd like to ask you something, Lord. She said, please, when you come back, when you set up your kingdom, when you reign from the river to the ends of the earth, I'd like for my two boys, James and John, one to sit on your right hand, one to sit on your left. How about that? You know, that was a noble request. Would God indeed that every mom and dad had this as the supreme ambition for their boy, their girl, that their children might sit thus on the right hand and the left hand of the Lord Jesus in the day of his power. That was a noble request, let me tell you. But the Lord Jesus looked at her and he said, I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Zebedee. Request denied. I'm very sorry, he said, I can't give you what you ask. And he might well have added, you see, you see, Mrs. Ebony, it's like this, my dear. I can't give it to you, you see, because those are not mine to give. That has to be earned. Yes, sir. When are we ever going to learn that while God gives us unmerited salvation, and thank God that he does he never gives unmerited rewards they have to be earned and that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about now here is the here is the formula or the equation if you want to go in for that who shall ascend? Who shall stand? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands, that's your outward life. Pure heart, that's your inward life. And God joins the heart and the hands together because we do what we do, because we are what we are. Christ-likeness of life. Christ-likeness of longings. Who shall ascend? Who shall stand? He that hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Yes. Who does that remind you of? Amen. Why doesn't it remind you of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes? Towards the end of his misspent life. Solomon, by the way, started so well, but he made awful shipwreck of his life before he was finished. The light that was in him was turned to darkness, and how great was that darkness. Solomon did more to tear down the kingdom of Israel than any other king who sat upon the throne of David. By the time Solomon was through with Jerusalem, he turned it into Babylon. Shameless things were done in the city of Jerusalem. He actually worshipped Moloch, the most savage god ever invented by a fiend out of hell. God said to him, now look here, he said, look here, look here. If it wasn't for David's sake, if it wasn't for David, I'd do it right now. But for David's sake, for David's sake, I'll wait until you're dead. But I'm going to tear your kingdom all to pieces. And Solomon went home. 
And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the wail of a despair over a misspent life. And all the way through that book you read the word vanity, vanity, vanity. Do you know what that word vanity means in our American vernacular? It literally means chasing the wind. And Solomon said that he had spent his life chasing the wind. He had thrown away a kingdom, an empire, and a crown by living for the wrong world. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Who wants to... Have a share, the Lord Jesus says. Who wants to ascend? Who wants to stand? He that hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. My friend, if you want to get that, you've got to live for the right world. Christ likeness of life and Christ likeness of longings and Christ likeness of language. Who shall ascend? Who shall stand? He that hath not sworn deceitfully. That is to say, God is looking for men and women and young people and boys and girls who will be absolutely dependable. People who say, I'll do it, and then they, they do it. No matter what the temptation not to do, they do it because they have passed their word. And once they say, I'll do it, then they do it because it would never occur to them to go back upon their word. Very hard to find people like that anymore. But he's looking for people who will be utterly dependent. Now that's the Lord's call. To have a share in everything that happens on the hill, everything that happens in the holy place, to share all the dynamics of secular power and all the dynamics of spiritual power in the day of his glory. Verses 7 to 10 deal with the Lord's coming. You will notice that five times in these closing verses the Lord Jesus is called the King of Glory. Twice the challenge goes forth that the gates of glory be lifted up. Twice the challenge is given, who is this king of glory? Yes. Once the answer is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Once the answer is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. <coughs> now that's not just Holy Ghost rhetoric. There is a reason why the question is asked twice and why the answer is different on each occasion to understand that we have to put things into perspective the Lord Jesus came down here to this planet on which we live he lived here for 33 and a half years and during that time he was the Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle. He won victory after victory over the world, the flesh and the devil. Every conceivable form of temptation was presented to him and pressed upon him. In the wilderness Satan tempted him with the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, the three great primeval and prevalent temptations of the human race. He had him betrayed, manhandled and mauled, had him scourged to the bone, crowned with thorns, taunted and crucified and mocked as he hung upon Calvary's tree. And then he ch challenged him and dared him to come down from the cross. It was all in vain. He was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Satan never won so much as the ghost of a victory. The Lord Jesus defeated Satan every single time. Not once in thought or word or deed. Whether as a babe or as a child or as a teenager or as a man. Whether in the home or in the classroom or in the synagogue or at the workbench. Or tra traveling the highways and byways of his native land. Satan never won a victory. 
He was the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, triumphed over demons and over disease and over death. And the very day the liturgists were tuning up to sing Psalm 24, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord, up from the grave the mighty triumph for his hope. Yes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Now he stayed around for 40 days, appearing here and appearing there. And then, at the end of that period of time, he gathered together that little band of excited disciples. He marched with them out through the gates of the city, down across the Kedron, up past the Garden of Gethsemane, to the brow of Olivet. And then he raised his hands in parting benediction and rose majestically toward the sky. The disciples stood there stunned and amazed and watched as the cloud came and wrapped him around. What happened after that, they did not see. But David, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit a thousand years before, he saw what happened next. The Lord Jesus mounted the star road to glory. He arrived outside the pearly gates of the celestial city. He said, lift up your head, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. A sentry at the gate gazed through and saw a man standing there. A man! in a battered human body. He said, who is this King of Glory? The Lord Jesus raised his nail-pierced hands. He said, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. They opened the gates and let him in. He went down Hallelujah Avenue, past Amen Square, along Hosanna Highway, and along Beulah Boulevard, until he came to the very throne of God, and then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The most astounding, amazing fact in the entire history of the universe is that there is a man in a human body sitting on the very throne of God in heaven and has every right to be there. Between verse 8 and verse 9, you have to put the entire church age. Now David didn't know that. Holy Spirit did. The Lord Jesus has been sitting now on his Father's throne this past 2,000 years. He has been watching with the keenest interest as the Holy Spirit has been down here doing his work. He has been calling out a people for his name. Been gathering them together from every kindred, tribe, people and tongue. Sometimes by thousands in times of Holy Ghost revival. Sometimes in ones and twos. Here a child at mother's knee. There an old man with one foot already in the grave. It's already a multitude that no man can number. A glorious church, heaven born and heaven bound, rooted in eternity, spread out through all time and space. And all this long time the Lord Jesus has been sitting on his Father's throne watching with the keenest interest. And as at the close of a meeting someone comes to give his heart to Jesus or somebody sits beside someone and leads that person to Christ, the, the Lord Jesus says to his Father, ah, here comes another one. Here comes another one. He sees of the travail of his soul and he's satisfied. Here comes another one. One of these days, the very last one will come. And then the father will say to his son, now go and get him. 
and the trumpet will sound and he'll swoop down the star-spangled splendor of the sky and he'll burst into the environs of the earth and he'll say, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away! And the graves will be emptied, the dead in Christ rise first, we who are alive remain caught up in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord Jesus will put himself at the head of this countless multitude. And he'll lead us to the very gates of glory. And he'll stand outside the gates of the celestial city again. And he'll say again, lift up your head, O ye gates. And the king of glory shall come in. The sentinel at the gate will look through and he'll say, who is this king of glory? And the Lord will point to us a multitude that no man can number. And he'll say, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. They'll swing wide the gates of the city and we'll go in with him. We'll go down Hallelujah Avenue, past Amen Square, along Hosanna Highway and Beulah Boulevard. <laughs> On the way I'll say, hey, there's my mansion over there. <laughs> the Lord Jesus will sit down on his Father's throne. And he'll say, now friends, just gather around. He said, uh, we're going back. We're going back. He'll say, you know, friends, the moment our back was turned, all hell was let loose down there on planet Earth. And we're going back. We're going back to put an end to it. He said, he'll say, and I'm going to get up off my father's throne in heaven, and I'm going to go down there and sit on the throne of my father David. <laughs> I'm going to set up an empire that will last for a thousand years and then merge into an eternal empire. And what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to reign from the river to the ends of the earth. The kind of empire the world has never seen. And I'll need some people to be my administrators in that empire. I'll need people to have a share in everything that happens on the hill and everything that happens in the holy place. All the dynamics of secular and spiritual power are going to be shared. Let me see your hand. Let me look at your heart. What world did you live for? Were you one of those kind of people that I could trust? <laughs> what about that? <laughs> what about that? <laughs> 